Welcome everyone. Um, for those of you who haven't attended SOCA rounds uh, previously, my name is Lauren Kelly and I'm a, uh, an assistant professor and trialist at the Georgia Fahey Center for Healthcare Innovation and I'm the chair of our SOCRA Winnipeg chapter. And it is my great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Kinder Chuck. Uh, Dr. Kindertrek is an assistant professor in the Department of Medical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases at the University of Manitoba. He also holds a Tier 2 Canada Research Chair in the Molecular Pathogenesis of Emerging and Re-Emerging Viruses. He has broad experience and interests in emerging viruses and in pandemic outbreak preparedness in both developing and developing nations. Um, importantly, he actively participates in multiple international scientific outreach activities to provide training and, um, and expertise to regional partners in Africa, including Sierra Leone, Gabon, and Kenya. Uh, Dr. Kinderchuk's research program focuses on investigating um, the investigation of emerging virus circulation, transmission and pathogenesis. Uh, in particular, his work focuses on viruses that pose a great risk to global health and animal health. Uh, and findings from his investigations help to inform emerging virus therapeutic treatment strategies, outbreak prediction, and preparedness efforts. Um, so with that bit of an introduction, uh, I am going to pass the mic over um, to Jason. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Lauren, for the, uh, the introduction. And, and just want to make sure that everybody can hear me okay? Yep. We're all good? Okay, good. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this has been um, a bit of a labor of love trying to get this this talk together uh, with, uh, with various things kind of in play. Um, and the best way for me to kind of say that is uh, all of you had received um, an email saying that I was going to be presenting and there was lots of uh, fanfare. Thank you uh, very much to Lauren for, for saying I was uh, ready to do this. And uh, then I was actually supposed to go to the Marshall Islands. Um, I was asked by uh, an international aid group to go and provide uh, COVID-19 pandemic response efforts uh, and uh, actually made it all the way to Honolulu uh, before they closed down the border um, to the Marshall Islands or the, uh, the entry into the Marshall Islands by non-residents. Um, so I spent uh, about the shortest amount of time possible in Honolulu, which was about 15 hours. Um, of which five hours was on the phone with United trying to get flights back um, to, uh, to get back to Winnipeg and, and basically email everybody back and say, oh, by the way, I can do this. Uh, and then the university shut down. So that being said, uh, you know, we always find a way somehow to adapt uh, and respond to, uh, to these kinds of things. So uh, we'll forge ahead. So to, to give you a bit of a background, um, you know, Lauren, uh, you know, very uh, kindly asked me to to give a, a brief bio, and I obviously uh, probably went a little bit overboard with with how much I supplied. Um, but to give you uh, a bit of an idea of what what my background is, um, I predominantly work with with emerging and, and re-emerging uh, infectious diseases. That's kind of been uh, the mainstay of of my entire career. Um, but over the last you know probably uh, I'd say close to twelve years now, just over a decade. Um, I've been predominantly working with, with high containment viruses. And the reason being is if we look at, at simply at this graph, so uh, Dr. David Morins, um, who uh, I know quite well and, and uh, worked with, uh, uh, actually shared some office space with for a bit when I was at the, the National Institutes of Health in, uh, in Washington. Um, David has been doing an update on this figure for the last probably, I don't know, probably uh, over a decade now um, trying to highlight kind of the continual burden of emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases that, uh, that, that we face. And the simple fact is, is that each year, each year and a half, when David goes through and updates this, um, the, essentially the, you know, the, the overall uh, map gets a, a little bit more ridiculous in terms of trying to define everything that's going on. Um, you know, so this is from 2017, so this was right after uh, we basically saw the emergence of, uh, or the reemergence of Zika virus, obviously through uh, South America and Central America, and then into uh, stretching in a little bit into the U.S. Um, but obviously, this uh, doesn't uh, encompass the uh, the more recent outbreaks of Ebola in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, as well as obviously what we're facing right now with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and for the most part, the you know I would say that the you know probably 70% of the pathogens that are on here. Um, I've had some direct experience wor uh, working with um, either in the field or, uh, or in the, the high containment laboratories, whether that's BSL-3 or BSL-4. So the, the simple fact is, when we look at 
this, uh, you know, we, when we look at the, the burden of infectious diseases that we're facing, um, I think this slide kind of perfectly encapsulates how I feel about things. And this slide, the reason I put it up was that I put together this talk or, or parts of this talk um, actually in, in October. And this was for uh, a talk within my department. And the thing that I was trying to get across at that point was this feeling that uh, across the board, um, we are not prepared for the, for the next pandemic. And, and that is not only by, uh, you know, felt by me, um, but also stakeholders uh, across the, the globe, including, um, uh, you know, different uh, uh, nation states as well as the World Health Organization. And so this basically a, a few years ago, there was a global preparedness monitoring board that was put together and they identified uh, seven urgent actions to prepare the world for health emergencies. And, and I just tend to kind of highlight the top four um, because I think it, it really goes back to this whole idea of why we struggle so much with, uh, with outbreaks, epidemics, and, and pandemics um, in terms of trying to why these, these events occur. Um, you know, and, and really the, the top four uh, actions really rely on, uh, you know, basically governments across the globe um, heavily committing uh, to and investing in uh, the development of, of healthcare and preparedness or, and or research infrastructure uh, within the most vulnerable regions of, of the world. Ultimately, what it comes down to is we, uh, as, a, you know, as a global unit and uh, you know, as, as unified people on, on this planet, are really only as strong as, as our most vulnerable regions. Uh, and, and I think again, we are, you know, we are seeing all this take place in, in real time. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about COVID-19 uh, afterwards. We're going to kind of talk about Ebola first, um, and you know, kind of some of the lessons learned from that, pushing into to what we're doing now. So ultimately, we're we are unprepared. We're we're seeing that in real time right now. Um, will we learn from from this pandemic? Um, I think there's you know there's a lot of discussion. Uh, about what we need to do for, for the next time. But there was also a lot of discussion post-2009 H1N1 pandemic and, uh, you know, post uh, multiple, uh, you know, Ebola epidemics and Zika and, and likewise. So um, I'm cautiously optimistic, um, but uh, I don't think anything is, is set in stone yet. So what, you know, where do I fit in with this and, and what do we really do? Um, you know, I, I'm 43, so I'm still trying to figure out, you know, what, what I am and, and who I am and hope one day I'll grow up and, and kind of understand that better. Um, but ultimately, what, what we're trying to do is really take a lot of the things that I'm interested in from, uh, you know, a, an emerging virus pathogenesis standpoint and look at this uh, a little bit more from, you know, what, uh, I guess an applied standpoint. So how can we take some of the things that we're doing in the laboratory or some of the things that that I have personal interests in and my students have interests in and directly apply those uh, in the field. And, and not only to try and understand um, you know, pathogenesis, but also to essentially build capacity um, and, and help build uh, preparedness in, in the regions that, that are most vulnerable for, for these diseases. So um, you know, I guess, spoiler alert, I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of my, my work in, in West Africa during the Ebola epidemic and, and some of the subsequent work that we're doing there. Uh, but I, I spent a lot of time in Africa. I've been uh, on the continent uh, five times over the last 12 months. Um, so predominantly, uh, I spend a lot of time in, in Sierra Leone. I have uh, some cross appointments there, um, but also uh, in working quite a bit in, in Central Africa, uh, particularly in Gabon. Um, Gabon has um, a high containment uh, research facility uh, and they do quite a bit of uh, field surveillance work. So it's been kind of a, a natural partnership. So I have um, cross appointments there. Uh, and then we're actually moving um, a, a little bit eastward across Africa. Um, and I'll kind of talk about this with Ebola, but I think we're starting to look at things, uh, you know, more from a One Health perspective. So, you know, how do we tie in, um, you know, basically not only humans and animals with, with pathogens, but also really the idea of how the environment uh, and their direct environment, um, you know, may, uh, you know, may influence, um, you know, these interactions and in particular the, the spillover of uh, emerging or re-emerging viruses. So we're actually working right now with, uh, with some folks that, that partner with the Diane Fossey Gorilla Foundation. 
Um, so we're uh, we're doing some work now, or, or starting up some work um, with uh, with folks that are that are doing surveillance work in Rwanda uh, to start to uh, to look at you know kind of the um, the implication of some of our viruses or some of the viruses we focus on uh, on uh, the conservation of um, of great apes. And uh, then lastly, um, it's not really highlighted on here, but I I actually just recently spent uh, three weeks in Nairobi. Uh, basically helping with uh, with just doing science outreach, uh, so running uh, emerging virus uh, outreach programs uh, for for students and and staff uh, within these regions because there's a there's a willingness to learn, but often it's a, it's a limitation in terms of uh, direct um, uh, direct infrastructure as well as as direct training. So ultimately, what what we're hoping to do is increase responsiveness through these capacity building and training activities that that we're involved in. Okay, so let's slip right over in, into Ebola virus. Um, there's, there, there's no easier kind of transition for me to do uh, with going into this. So um, Ebola virus is the reason that I uh, am where I am in my career for, for better or for worse. Uh, I, you know, I was born in 77, so that means uh, you know, when the book The Hot Zone came out and the movie Outbreak came out, um, you know, that was you know, kind of 94, so that was kind of you know, right at the end of high school, right when I was probably at my most influential. Um, and just was fascinated by, by the idea that, you know, you could have a virus that essentially has seven genes uh, in it, and that this virus could, uh, you know, essentially could wipe out in entire communities. Um, and, and we really had no way of, of combating this. So, you know, lo and behold, uh, a number of years later, uh, I guess I am now somewhat uh, an expert in this, though I'm still uh, learning on a daily basis. Um, the reason that we're interested in Ebola virus, so it, it comes from uh, the Filoviridae uh, family of viruses, which basically means the, the filamentous uh, virus family. Um, Ebola virus uh, is found in this family as well as Marburg virus. Uh, Marburg virus emerged in 1967. Um, it, it emerged in, uh, in Uganda, um, but actually uh, essentially infected uh, workers that were working with non-human primate samples uh, in Marburg, Germany, uh, as well as uh, uh, Belgrade, um, and ultimately uh, what ended up happening is that the virus just got named uh, Marburg. So we, we've known about Marburg for a long time. Um, Post-1967, it disappeared, and then in 1976, uh, we had uh, essentially side-by-side -side outbreaks, um, or, or um, I guess uh, correlative uh, outbreaks uh, in Sudan, as well as uh, at that point in Zaire, which is now Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, and these were two different strains or two different species of uh, Ebola viruses as a whole. So Ebola virus is one word, is the genus. Um, and then it gets really confusing and I, I don't want to get too far into the weeds, um, but the specific species we're gonna talk about is actually Ebola space virus. Um, and uh, I have friends that uh, I yell at consistently about their choice of taxonomy for, for this. So just a quick overview. It, it's a very simple virus, seven genes. Um, ultimately, we see uh, 10 proteins that are produced from this virus, uh, the vast majority of which are involved directly in just forming the, the uh, large overall structure of the virus. Um, but a couple of proteins, VP35 and VP24, which are viral protein 24 and viral protein 35, not surprisingly based on, on their uh, overall size when you, uh, when you run them out on uh, SDS gels. Uh, both of these proteins have interferon uh, antagonism activities. So ultimately what happens is that these two proteins help with uh, essentially uh, modulating the immune system early in the course of disease and then basically uh, everything kind of breaks out. Um, I always put this picture up because I like to give John Birnbaum uh, from the National Institutes of Health a, a nice shout out. Uh, he's an electron microscopist that I worked with. Um, this is actually a picture uh, of a cell that is infected with Ebola and Ebola is basically leaving the cell. So the green in the background is a Vero cell, so just a, an African green monkey kidney cell that we use uh, quite often in the lab for viral infections. All the blue spaghetti is what Ebola looks like when, when it leaves. Um, I think it gives a nice representation of what this actually looks like, um, you know, kind of at the, at the nuts and bolts of, uh, of infection. So, the reason that I just want to focus solely on Ebola virus, or, or what we also call, call Zaire Ebola virus, 
or EBOV for short, is it is the one that is implicated in the majority of uh, outbreaks uh, and epidemics for Ebola that or for Ebola viruses that, that we've ever seen. And that includes uh, the West African epidemic from uh, the end of 2013 to 2016. Uh, and all of the subsequent outbreaks uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, including the one that uh, that it is currently ongoing. Um, pathogenesis, I, I throw this up uh, because I think it's important to just have some ideas of, of what happens when we get infected. Um, and mostly because a lot of this we don't truly understand. Uh, and that's where my concern comes in, uh, because we're dealing now with, you know, 44 years uh, following the identification of the, the you know original emergence of this virus in the human population, I think we're still somewhat at um, a remedial level with understanding what happens, kind of you know immediately following uh, contact of the virus with uh, with with our bloodstream uh, with, or with our mucosal membranes. So just kind of you know take it back square one. We think that this virus circulates in bats, predominantly uh, a few different species of fruit bats. Um, we've never been able to recover uh, fully infectious virus from bats, nor whole genome from bats. So all of the implications that we have for bats being the, the reservoir species for Ebola is primarily based off the fact that uh, they, they have shown seroconversion. So they're obviously getting exposed. Uh, and there have been partial genome sequences that have been recovered from bats for Ebola specifically. Uh, and for Marburg virus, which is uh, you know, obviously uh, within the same family as Ebola, uh, Marburg has been recovered uh, as, an, as an infectious virus uh, inoculum from bats. So all of this points to, to this, the fact that bats, yet again, uh, fairly or unfairly are implicated as you know, kind of the, the harbingers of, uh, of horrible, horrible viruses. Um, what we think happens is that at some point, uh, bats spill, basically allow the virus to spill over, um, largely we think to non-human primates. So chimpanzees and gorillas are particularly prone uh, to infection uh, from Ebola viruses, um, or potentially through direct contact of humans uh, with infected bats. Um, we know that the, where we think the virus is likely excreted in things like saliva or urine, um, but the, probably the, the greater likelihood um, is that bats are consumed um, essentially as, as wild game uh, within uh, you know, many parts of, of Africa, including West and Central Africa. Um, we think that the likelihood is that people are either hunting bats or, or finding them um, and then basically have contact exposures uh, as essentially they're cleaning the meat. Um, the other simple fact is uh, non-human primates including great apes, are, are also consumed as game meat. So again, we think that a lot of these infections uh, largely occur probably through abrasions on the skin uh, during the cleaning of the meat, or um, potentially uh, interactions with biological fluids uh, directly through uh, the, the eyes or through uh, the mucosa uh, in the mouth. Where we're at a little bit of a black box is what happens immediately following that contact. Um, we, we don't really know what we think. So we know that uh, monocytes, dendritic cells, and macrophages um, are particularly uh, uh, susceptible to Ebola virus infection. Um, what we think is that uh, immediately following contact, um, the virus likely invades these cells, um, but through in the, basically the uh, ability to antagonize interferon responses, um, the virus basically is able to circulate within those infected cells into the lymph nodes. Uh, and basically not be recognized by the immune system. And what we think happens is that once the virus gets into the lymph nodes, uh, after you know, a, a you know, kind of short period of time, the incubation period is two to 21 days, um, but you know, uh, usually a little bit shorter as opposed to longer, um, we think that the virus is actively replicating in these infected um, uh, mononuclear cells. And then ultimately what happens at some point is there's a, essentially a tipping point event the virus basically breaks out of these infected cells uh, and, uh, you know, and, and is then uh, transferred uh, throughout the, the rest of, uh, of the system through the, the pulmonary circulation. Um, surprisingly, lymphocytes, so uh, NK cells, B cells, and T cells are refractory to Ebola infection, um, but we see massive apoptosis uh, during the early stages of infection in both uh, humans as well as non-human primates. 
Um, so we, we think that the role uh, of this is mostly, again, to try and suppress the, the early immune response. Ultimately, what happens is that the virus uh, will likely cause uh, multi-organ failure, so targets the liver, uh, kidney, and spleen, although we do see, uh, particularly in West Africa, um, we've seen quite a bit of uh, respiratory complication uh, in many of those patients, particularly the ones that were medevaced out of West Africa. Um, I think nearly all of them, if not all, were, uh, were put on mechanical ventilation. Um, and then we do see some signs of, uh, of uh, fluid loss and hemorrhage in patients. Um, a lot of patients have, you know, it can lose up to three to six liters of fluid a day, largely through uh, diarrhea and vomiting um, at, at the peak of illness. Um, hemorrhage, we see, I think, you know, around 25% of patients uh, will show some signs of hemorrhage. Usually it's, it's blood and stool or blood and vomit. Um, and those patients that show hemorrhage uh, likely are going to be the ones that, uh, that are going to have fatal infection. Um, I'm going to kind of skip through this fairly quickly so that I don't kind of get too into the weeds. Um, but really, when we talk about this whole idea of bats as being the, the reservoir, the, the reason we do is ultimately um, to, to try and eradicate this, the, this disease and this virus, um, even though we have a vaccine that seems to be quite efficacious um, and, and you know, obviously has worked, uh, we think, seemingly quite well in, in the DRC, um, ultimately we, we have to be able to find out where this virus is, is hiding and, and um, uh, circulating in nature to be able to, to even consider trying to find a way uh, to eradicate it. And again, spoiler alert, we, we likely never will, just because of the fact of uh, the, the way bat populations behave and, and the sheer numbers that there are. Um, but we're starting to get a little bit of an idea of you know, what, what actually happens during the circulation of Ebola and the actual uh, uh, you know, transmission and, and spillover events. And we think a lot of this has to actually do um, with shifts between the wet and dry season. Um, and a lot of that is based on uh, basically the proximity of other animals uh, in, in the forests, um, uh, you know, and in, in, in tropical regions of Africa, um, being in close proximity to bats during the dry season because they're all competing for, for the same food sources. Um, as I said, uh, you know, Ebola viruses, uh, from, from my standpoint, are uh, a massive issue in terms of conservation uh, efforts, in particular with great apes. So Ebola viruses have ultimately decimated great ape populations. Uh, it's been estimated that up to about a third of the world's population of gorillas uh, essentially have been wiped out from Ebola virus um, uh, outbreaks or epidemics. Uh, and we think that it's had uh, also a, a concomitant uh, toll on uh, chimpanzee um, populations as well. And obviously, so there, from a conservation standpoint, there's an importance to this, um, but also potentially, uh, you know, from the standpoint of uh, spillover events from these infected animals to humans. Um, so we're trying to figure out ways to now, uh, you know, approach basically uh, different communities to discuss, um, you know, some of the, uh, the hunting practices uh, that, that they employ. And, and this is where it gets to be, um, you know, a, a little bit more difficult because in the past, I think we've been a bit heavy handed. We've gone into communities and said, you shouldn't eat bats, you shouldn't eat great apes. Um, you know, that, that's where we think the virus is coming from. Um, in a lot of these communities, these are staple, uh, staple food sources um, and we're not really providing them with an alternative. So I think without taking uh, those considerations into account, um, you know, what, what we're ultimately going to do is, is basically, um, you know, force away a lot of these communities from wanting to participate with us. So uh, I think we're trying to move more in a direction of actually having conversation about safe practices uh, as opposed to um, abolishing uh, their, their idea of, uh, of hunting practices. Um, there's, I'm not going to spend much time uh, deliberating about this, um, but we are seeing quite a bit of work now that is looking at the effects of environmental factors, uh, including climate change, on the spillover of Ebola virus specifically. And the reason is that ultimately, um, what I think we're, we're starting to understand more is that if these viruses are circulating in nature, in particular if they're circulating in bats, um, considering the sheer number of bats that, that have been um, assessed in the wild for virus and the limitations in the uh, amount of virus that, or even uh, viral signals that, that we've ever seen, um, we don't think that these viruses are constantly 
uh, replicating uh, to, uh, to measurable titers uh, or measurable concentrations within these animals. So what we're starting to look at a little bit more is the role of environmental factors um, in, uh, in basically uh, circulation of, uh, of the virus and spillover events. You know, so are, are there things like, um, you know, temperature um, requirements since bats are able to regulate their, their body temperature uh, based on the, the surrounding environment? Um, can, you know, basically do we see a shift in things like viral replication based on whether it's, you know, colder or warmer climates for bats? Um, do we see shifts uh, that, you know, that, uh, you know, lead to spillover events that are related to things like forest cover um, or forest fragmentation um, or precipitation. Um, all of these factors we're now able to assess uh, basically using satellite imagery data. Uh, and we're actually collaborating um, with uh, Dr. David Walker out at the Fort Geary campus, um, who's had some experience with, with doing this and using uh, satellite imagery data specifically for Africa um, to, to look at these factors. Uh, and the nice thing is that um, all that data is freely available, and there's about 40 years worth of, uh, of imagery data specifically for Africa. So it gives us a chance to essentially look back through time and overlay a, a lot of that data with, with spillover events or outbreak events um, to start to maybe, uh, you know, guide our practices for, for surveillance in the field uh, and for the collection of animal samples. Um, so that, you know, maybe we're, we can do this a little bit uh, from a little bit more guided of an approach. Um, and, you know, it, the other thing that, that we're starting to, to, well, I should say we're starting to look at, that's kind of a mainstay in my laboratory um, and, and really came to light during the West African uh, Ebola epidemic. Um, and, and I'll kind of, I'll go back to kind of a historical perspective on this for a second. Um, I was in West Africa from uh, October, or sorry, September to October 2014. Um, and came back and was working at the, uh, basically the, the critical care medicine department where I was a, a staff scientist um, and uh, an infectious disease uh, doc who's a, a really good friend of mine, Dr. Dan Chertow, uh, and I had talked about getting a clinical protocol together uh, if and when the NIH um, ever got Ebola patients in to their uh, special clinical studies unit because we had put out uh, basically a request for patients that were medevaced to, to come uh, basically to our department uh, where we would provide supportive care. Um, and, and Dan Chertow was, was leading those efforts. Um, but Dan and I had read about these anecdotal reports um, of potential sexual transmission of Ebola um, from recovered males to their female partners. Um, so we had a patient that came in uh, March 2015. Um, he was day seven clinical illness. Uh, and we carried him through, uh, right through to convalescence, um, and he was ultimately uh, given placebo uh, in a, a clinical uh, trial that, that he had been enrolled in. So we found out all of that, um, obviously retrospectively, uh, after the trial was done. But we had asked our, our patient um, just prior to, uh, to being let out of the hospital um, if he minded uh, providing us with with semen samples and and consistent semen samples or temporal semen samples over the course of uh, the ensuing year, and he agreed. So we took our first semen sample uh, day 32 post uh, onset of symptoms, uh, and he was released day 33. Um, so I will just throw out the caveat that we did not start looking at samples um, until the fourth month post recovery, but what we found was that on day 32 our patient had about four logs higher of virus uh, in his semen than he ever did at the peak of viremia. Um, why I say that and, and why I always kind of pause afterwards is that that patient was physiologically normal. Uh, and when we did blood diagnostics, which is what uh, we would uh, do to, to ensure that the patient was negative prior to being released, um, that patient was, was negative uh, across numerous uh, diagnostics and remain negative uh, from a, a, a viremia standpoint. So what this ultimately means for us is that from a containment perspective, uh, and when we look at outbreak response efforts, um, in the past we used to just think, uh, I think the, the primary belief was that as long as Ebola, you know, Ebola uh, virus uh, disease patients survived, they were ultimately, uh, they would ultimately have long-term immunity. 
but they could not pass the virus on to their communities. Um, ultimately, we were wrong. And I think that's a massive issue for us because we had built up a lot of trust in the communities with reaccepting these patients uh, back, back into their relative communities um, post-recovery with the belief that, that they would not be able to pass on the virus. Um, we have to rethink our strategy now with how we do that. Um, I've been in contact with, with folks from WHO that are in the Democratic Republic of Congo now. We're still seeing um, sexual transmission cases. Uh, we, we've seen sexual transmission cases uh, from, from 1967 onwards, um, but they've been, uh, they've been kind of few and far between. West Africa blew everything open for us because we had so many patients. Um, but we do now understand that about 50% of male survivors uh, will have persistent testicular infections at least to six months following recovery, and about 10 to 20% of those patients will carry it out uh, beyond uh, 12 months. Uh, and we have seen now patients with some signs of uh, virus in their semen out to even 40 plus months. So th this is a, a, an obvious problem for us when we start thinking about containment strategies and our communication strategies with, um, you know, with regions that are affected by this virus. Okay, so jump into where, you know, some of my background with, with West Africa in particular and talking about contributing factors uh, to the epidemic and things that I think are important. So I went to Liberia. Um, so I was there, like I said, September 2014. Uh, Liberia is obviously uniquely surrounded by Sierra Leone uh, and Guinea. Uh, and to the east, uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Um, it was colonized by freed U.S. slaves in the 1820s. Um, what's interesting about that is that freed U.S. slaves uh, that were repatriated back to Liberia uh, actually set up um, a slavery system with, uh, with the local population. Um, so what it's created is a bit of, uh, a bit of angst towards, towards the West. Um, and, and that ultimately, uh, obviously, uh, showed through uh, during the, the first and second civil wars um, in the late 90s and early 2000s that claimed about 250,000 to 500,000 Liberians. So the current population is about 4 million. Uh, a million of those live within the capital in Monrovia. 85% um, of the population of the country lives below the international poverty line, and they have the third lowest GDP in the world. So it, it, it's kind of, when we look at vulnerable regions to these types of viruses, Liberia, is, is somewhat of kind of the, you know, the absolute unequivocal case study for this. Um, the, the 2014 to 2016 uh, epidemic timeline, um, not surprisingly, you know, we, so we saw the initial case was actually way back December 31st, 2013. Um, things started to really spiral out of control by kind of the springtime or early summer. Um, and then by the time we actually hit in August, um, we started to see uh, American healthcare workers uh, getting sick. And once that happened, um, basically the, uh, the U.S. government asked for people to volunteer uh, to go over to, to provide um, a diagnostic uh, or healthcare response um, on the ground. So public health emergency got declared August 8th. Um, I was on the ground, uh, I think, around September 2nd. Um, so basically about a week after... Uh, there was a, um, a militant group had started uh, digging up bodies um, in around Monrovia and pulling them onto the highways because they wanted to try to prove the point that the virus was not real. Um, so I ultimately spent about a month there, just over a month. Uh, I came back to the U.S. in September 30th and came through customs at JFK Airport when the first U.S. case was announced in, in Dallas, Texas. Um, so very thankfully, the customs official looked at my H-1B uh, visa and my passport and uh, just brushed me through as, as quickly as possible. Um, but ultimately what happened is that the, uh, the, the epidemic continued to spiral out of control and ultimately it wasn't until 2016 that, that we were able to get things uh, curbed. Um, a lot of this, I'm not gonna play the video, but a lot of this was based off of, uh, at least for Liberia, um, off of cases that were quarantined uh, in the West Point slum area of, Liberia, of Monrovia which is about 20 to 80,000 people. Uh, it was an immediate quarantine. There was no warning and there was no movement uh, allowed in or out. So what ended up happening was that there was no transfer of, uh, of goods or, or food or, or uh, medicine um, uh, in or out of, of, that, uh, of that slum area. So there was a vocal opposition within the slum uh, 
that ultimately uh, believed that this was essentially the government uh, trying to get rid of all the people in the slum area. And those people went into the clinics where there were Ebola patients that were being cared for, pulled the Ebola patients out into the crowds, um, and basically looted the hospital, including uh, most of the, the sheets and the bedding um, from, from the room where those Ebola patients were. And there's quite a bit of news footage uh, showing that. So this is, this is not just me, um, you know, kind of uh, extending what, uh, what may be misinformation. Uh, we, we do definitively know that, that that occurred. So we saw mass exposure events and uh, and basically that was kind of the uh, the dawning of uh, of the worst portion of the outbreak uh, in Liberia. Um, so I went from Frederick, Maryland, from this brand new BSL-4 facility, um, basically out here to Monrovia. Um, I had not been to Africa before, uh, so this was a you know a, a pretty big change for me. Um, but what I do want to point out is. You know, when we talk about sobering lessons of of seeing you know infectious disease, uh, you know from from a direct point of view and and on a daily basis, um, this is Elwa three. This is the the largest uh, clinical, I guess, tent hospital uh, that uh, that that was in Liberia at the time. Um, this I think was taken on the second or third day that I was in Liberia, so they had already run out of bed space at that point. So these are patients outside um, that uh, that are waiting to get in. Um, some of these patients were quite sick, if, if not dead at that point. Others were ambulatory and, and still uh, quite well or in the early stages of disease. Um, but each day as we drove by, we would see more and more people outside. Um, you know, so when we talk about you know, the reasonings or when people ask the reason of why I do what I do, uh, this, is, this is why. So what were the contributing factors? Well, ultimately, uh, a lot of things. So anything from political instability and poverty um, so there was no, you know, real healthcare infrastructure uh, or healthcare or viable healthcare system. Um, there really wasn't a lot of coordination in terms of who was in charge, and that was both at the national and international level. Um, we had high incidence of various infectious diseases in the region, so uh, there was somewhat of a, a laissez-faire attitude uh, almost with with healthcare providers um, in the region initially because of the fact that this didn't look like anything different from what they had seen before. Um, but the biggest thing was when we looked at, again, at, at health care. So out of 4 million people in Liberia, um, just prior to the Ebola virus disease outbreak, there were somewhere between 350 to 400 total hospital beds uh, in the country and three ambulances, uh, two of which were used uh, primarily to move samples uh, back and forth to diagnostic labs. So all of these things factor in. Uh, and I'm going to skip a, a little bit ahead, uh, actually quite a lot ahead, to COVID-19 and why I think this is important. Um, so I, I learned a lot in terms of how quickly, um, you know, small uh, kind of cracks in the system um, can exacerbate uh, outbreaks and, and epidemics in, in vulnerable regions of the world. COVID-19 has kind of shown us that, but also what happens when there's cracks in the system uh, in, in developed nations. So, to give you a, a kind of a quick background, um, you guys have all heard or you, you people have all heard about coronaviruses like, you know, mad the last couple of months. Um, I worked quite a bit on MERS uh, coronavirus in the past and a little bit on SARS. Uh, we're now funded to do some work with uh, SARS coronavirus too. Um, but the coronaviridae uh, virus family is their RNA viruses. They have massive genomes. Um, and there are seven coronaviruses that cause disease in humans. So prior to the emergence of SARS in 2002, there were four coronaviruses that were known to infect humans, but those largely uh, caused uh, you know, mild illness and cold-like illness in, in people. Um, we saw some cases of severe disease, but they, they really weren't of, of interest and, and definitely not from an epidemic or pandemic um, uh, potential standpoint. And that obviously changed with the emergence of SARS in 2002 uh, and then the subsequent emergence of uh, MERS uh, coronavirus uh, in 2012 uh, in the Middle East, and now SARS coronavirus 2, uh, as well from China, and, and which has now been declared a pandemic. Uh, we call, so what, what we were originally calling 2019 novel coronavirus is now SARS coronavirus 2, based on uh, genome similarity to SARS coronavirus, which makes things really confusing. Uh, but SARS CoV 2 causes coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID 19. So um, we think that uh, you know a lot of things are shared with other RNA viruses. We think that 
coronaviruses are predominantly circulating in bats in nature, and that spillover events to other incidental hosts ultimately uh, lead to, uh, to human disease. So with SARS, uh, this was primarily through palm civets and other animals in live animal markets. With MERS, it was through camels, or we, uh, the, we haven't seen any other species outside of uh, camels that, that seem to be incidental hosts for MERS, but ultimately it leads to zoonotic transmission to, to humans. Uh, we don't know yet with SARS-CoV-2 what is going on. Um, where I think I got really interested with this, um, on December 31st, so to give you an idea of what happens when you have a 17-month-old toddler uh, and a, a partner that uh, is extremely uh, tired from running around after said 17-month-old toddler, uh, even on uh, New Year's Eve, uh, you, you take to, to social media and other things to kind of keep yourself entertained uh, while everybody falls asleep. Um, so I was actually having a conversation with Dr. Megan May uh, in the U.S., who, uh, who also works on emerging viruses. And we had actually read a news story um, about basically what was being called uh, suspected um, SARS-like illness in Wuhan, China. Uh, and, and both Megan and I kind of you know, talked back and forth a little bit about what we thought it could, it could be. It didn't make much sense that it, SARS suddenly just reemerged. Uh, we hadn't seen it since 2004. Um, I thought it might be H7N9 influenza, but uh, that also didn't make sense based on, on, on the, uh, the area where we were seeing it and the description of, uh, of some of the, case, uh, uh, the cases that we were seeing. Um, but we talked about the fact that, you know, could this be something new? And lo and behold, uh, this is where our pandemic started. So everything started in Hubei province, um, primarily in Wuhan. There was a potential link to a wholesale uh, seafood market, which housed a lot of animals. Um, this has pretty much been debunked now. Um, there is, uh, there was, I think that the feeling right now is that there was likely human to human transmission um, at the, the seafood market, but we, uh, we have identified cases uh, of uh, COVID-19 that predate uh, basically this cluster from the end of December uh, that, that was linked to the seafood market. So this is where we were January 31st. Um, I was still uh, in Nairobi at the time and, and starting to get a, a lot of press requests on what we thought was going on because cases were spreading fairly quickly in China. Although at that point, China had instituted pretty strong quarantine procedures uh, to, to hopefully try and, and quell uh, transmission across Europe throughout Asia and then ultimately uh, you know, across the rest of the globe. Uh, that has obviously changed as we all know. Uh, and, and obviously with the closure of the university, we now know the situation is, is pretty dire. Um, what we've seen is, you know, basically complete spread across Europe. Um, we've seen infiltration into North America and South America, as well as through Africa. Um, so I, I think what a lot of us can do now is we can look back at what's been going on in Europe and really use this as somewhat of a guide for, um, for, for what we're, we're going to see in terms of spread. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and at least use that somewhat for modeling for our own containment procedures. Uh, so what we know right now where we're sitting at, um, the likelihood is, is that we think this virus spilled over from bats. Uh, it, it fits all the hallmarks of that from what we see with other coronaviruses, as well as from the, the genome uh, sequences uh, and, uh, and some of the codon usage. Um, what we also know, uh, and this is very thankfully to Dr. Ian McKay for, for putting this uh, figure together, uh, we know the virus is spread predominantly through respiratory droplets, uh, and we think that that extends out to about six feet, which is why we hear about the, the idea of two meters apart from each other. So we're, we're not looking at a fully aerosolized virus, but what we do know is that coughing, sneezing, uh, or even things like laughing likely will lead to, uh, to dissemination of the virus through respiratory droplets. Routes of transmission, um, we think predominantly through, again, through respiratory droplets. Um, we're starting to see some data that suggests other biological samples may or may not be positive for virus. I read one paper last night that talked about fecal samples. Uh, looking at electron uh, microscopy, they were able to identify uh, what looked like whole virions, uh, though a lot of viruses look very similar, so it doesn't necessarily say it's, uh, it's SARS-CoV-2. But we do see different biological fluids that could be positive. So um, it, there, there could be secondary routes of, uh, of transmission, um, and, and we'll become more aware of that over, obviously, over time. Um, 
my issues with science communication and messaging in just the last couple of minutes, I'll kind of wind this up. So going back to when I was still in Nairobi in January, um, you know, I, basically there was, there was an immediate response that talked about uh, live animal markets. And, and obviously, um, listen, I'm, I'm uh, a massive animal advocate. Uh, I, I love animals. Um, but I think what ended up happening was that everybody immediately believed that this virus had emerged specifically because of the live animal markets. And that created, uh, I think, a lot of, um, definitely a lot of uh, uh, anti-Chinese sentiment um, and, uh, you know, and, and a lot of question regarding um, societal norms uh, across different regions of the world. Ultimately, what we found out from a Lancet article was that some of the cases uh, were identified way out to December 1st of 2019, if not prior to that, and I think some cases now predate into November, that had no, um, uh, basically uh, nothing to do or, or, or no relation back to the seafood market. So I think we have to think a little bit about, you know, when, we, when we're doing messaging, what we're saying and how we actually present our data. Um, that also is critically important when we talk about um, what we think is, is transmission. So this figure is from New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, this was uh, based on a, a Chinese business lady that had gone to Germany um, and had supposedly spread the virus uh, to German colleagues uh, through asymptomatic transmission. So this paper came out, we're still dealing with um, a, a lot of question about what the role of asymptomatic transmission is in driving this pandemic. Ultimately, what we found out from the patient herself is that she was mildly symptomatic while in Germany. Um, but the problem is, is that story, uh, as soon as it came out, um, spread like wildfire. So even with uh, validated reports afterwards, we're having trouble with, with changing the messaging. And that comes back to this whole idea of where I think, you know, we, we as scientists have a, a social uh, responsibility in how we deliver our data. And I think, you know, this is the first um, you know, health crisis and, and definitely the first pandemic where we've been dealing with real-time social media updates by scientists on their observations from, from their experiments. Um, and this has been fantastic. It's been fantastic for me to share data back and forth with colleagues around the world. Uh, and be able to fully understand um, you know, what, what's going on with this virus, in particular with, with spread and pandemic preparedness. Um, but we've seen the, the dark side of this as well. Um, you know, quite a bit of, of discussion of where the virus had emerged from. Um, we saw a, a massive amount of media interest in the story that the virus had likely emerged from snakes, which we now know, uh, at least um, people much smarter than me that are bioinformaticists, uh, think was, was largely flawed data. Um, we have seen uh, preprint articles um, claiming that the virus uh, potentially had HIV sequences uh, that, that were unique uh, or new, uniquely inserted within the genome, um, which, uh, spoiler alert, these were 12 nucleotides in size, so they ultimately were 100% similar to many other viruses and organisms outside of HIV. But this has really driven the narrative about this virus being bioengineered. Um, and obviously has driven some of the narrative about uh, uh, potential links back to, to Winnipeg uh, and even one the other day back to um, the passing of Dr. Frank Plummer. So when we, when we talk about our studies, when we talk about our data, what, what I think we need to do, and I think it's imperative for us to do, is always remember the context and the interpretation of our data. What, what are we actually trying to say? Uh, in particular, at this point, time when we have a lot of people that are on social media that are picking up on our tweets or, or basically you know monitoring our tweets and, and looking for information to be able to pass on uh you know an example that i have you know 6500 followers on on twitter um which boggles my mind i, I shouldn't be interesting to more than probably 6.5 people um but we are we are being followed i think people want to want to hear what you know what we're doing and, and what our takes are on a lot of these things. So I think we just need to be careful with our messaging now more than ever. So with that, I'll kind of wrap it up. Um, I'm not gonna go through all the acknowledgements uh, because it, it spans uh, you know, multiple continents now. Um, obviously all of, uh, all of uh, my, uh, my funders um, have been amazing. Uh, I, I appreciate so much their belief in, in the things we're doing. 
Um, but all of my collaborators uh, and, and my grad students, they, they have been unbelievably indispensable in, in the work that, that we've been doing and we continue to do. Uh, and I thank all of you and, and welcome any questions that you might have. Great, thank you, Jason. That was really informative. I think I learned a lot and I'm so happy that this is recorded because I'll probably have to watch it again. <laughs> um, so I think we'll open the chat if anyone has any questions, but um, while people are thinking and writing, um, I just wanted to ask you, and this is something that I know you and I have talked about before, and I think it'd be of interest to the audience, but um, I really appreciate your sentiment about engaging and engaging the communities and considering things like their hunting practices and traditional cultural practices of the region. And, you know, I know you spend a lot of time sort of getting to know, getting to know the community as mm -hmm. opposed to sort of just going in and imposing research. So I, could, I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about um, maybe sort of how you plan for something like that, how you plan to engage with the community, you know, how do you learn about what's culturally appropriate um, and how yeah. do you make sure you apply that in your research? So the, the most important thing I've learned is, is, is honestly, having champions uh, in the field um, fr from those regions that you know that are supportive of the work that you're doing and understand why you're doing it so a, a lot of the work that we've been you know that that's being driven right now and, and one of the things I didn't talk about we're working a lot with uh, with Ebola virus disease survivors trying to understand uh, the, the long-term health complications they face in particular uh, looking at reproductive health considering what we know about uh, testicular persistence now um, you know, we found advocates in the community that um, that had an interest in in research that had uh, been publishing. And honestly, I, I mean, I, listen, I, I don't have any qualms about just reaching out to to people directly. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I basically started doing a lot of cold calls uh, to uh, to people and, and sending a lot of emails, um, basically giving uh, you know giving you know pretty much complete transparency on on what we're doing, um, but why we're doing it. Uh, and also pitching it from the idea of not just, you know, this is a collaboration that you could be involved in that will benefit you, but more so um, this is something we want to do uh, in the field in your country that will involve uh, people that, uh, you know, that you know and people in your community that will help pass on expertise and knowledge translation. Um, to me, that has been the most important because in all of these regions, that, that I've worked in, there are people that want to, to learn and expand their knowledge base. And in a lot of cases, um, want to be able to expand that uh, in country. So that they're, they're looking specifically at what can they do to help you know, Sierra Leone or Gabon or Kenya um, or, or DRC or Republic of Congo. Um, those are the people that, that are most important for us to get involved with because mm -hmm. the, they are the ones that are, are going to help with, uh, you know, with finding other people in the community that are, that are like-minded and also um, uh, help us with uh, getting across and communicating uh, what, what are the most important facets of our research with, with the community. Yeah, that's really important. And I think um, develop, finding key people that can help share your message um, is always important. Um, and the idea of reciprocity, so not just, you know, what's in it for us and getting big papers, but also what's yeah. in it for the community and, and having them involved at all aspects. Yeah. I think these are really great points. And um, I do have another question, sort of a different topic, but about um, trust for science. So yes. um, uh, you talked about, you know, Chinese, um, there being some really racist things happening and, and some uh, maybe unfair um, unfair posts and, and conspiracy theories and lots of lots of craziness but yeah. um there is also a lot of good science coming out of china and so yeah. i think um you know i'd like to maybe hear your thoughts a little bit about like so for example the study i'm thinking of is they just published the first 10 pregnant women um who had severe yeah. infections um with covid19 that delivered um children and so yes. um you know a lot of people are taking this very seriously. The outcomes were not very good. And, and this is, you know, a lot, some of the countries have now put pregnant women on the high risk category, but sure. then there's also some people who say, well, you know, oh, it's from China, so I don't believe it. And I yeah. just wonder how you kind of critically appraise research and um, what tips you have. It's been so frustrating, right? So yeah. <laughs> I, I say that because, you know, listen, when we look back to our identification of, of uh, SARS-CoV-2, um, that was all based off of Chinese researchers that uh, very quickly, um, you know, got all the genome sequences uh, together and released that data um, w without waiting for publication. So they made it freely available. And and to be fair, they have continually been doing that with, mm -hmm. um, you know, through preprints with just an unbelievable uh, amount of clinical data. 
Yeah. And I, you know, so I, I think what's important for us and, and what I've been trying to do uh, as much as I can through social media and, 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 you know, obviously have been learning from, from others that, that do it better uh, and do it more frequently is trying to amplify the good science uh, that, that is coming out from different regions of the world, in particular from China right now. Um, you know, we can spend a lot of time trying to, uh, you know, pick apart and tease apart uh, all of the, the different conspiracies and, and prove how they're wrong in a lot of mm -hmm. cases. Uh, my experience with, with the anti-vax world has, has, you know, has taught me a lot <laughs> of things. Um, it, 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 it is not, you're not going to convince those people. Um, right. Your time is much better spent uh, advocating and, and um, applauding the, the, the work of, of others from, uh, from, from those regions. Yeah, no, that's great points. Thanks. So if there's any questions in the chat, it doesn't look like there's any questions in the chat here. I'm not sure if anyone has any questions, um, but do you have any last words you want to say? Um, and if not, then, <laughs> uh, you yeah, know, like to, what? <laughs> yeah, I, well, yeah, no, I, I'm just saying like I did, uh, I did a bunch of uh, uh, CTV spots yesterday. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of a lot of COVID nineteen interviews uh, as of late. Um, there's a, and listen. I, I know a lot of people are probably getting uh, maybe tired of hearing my voice or seeing uh, my name in, in media. Um, the, the reason that I'm doing this right now is I do really feel uh, across the board, regardless if it's infectious disease research or, um, or or you know whatever research you're involved in, uh, you are a voice. And and I think ultimately that there is a social responsibility still for us as scientists. Um, to provide back communication to the community, um, because ultimately all this work has an has an impact, and and ultimately is you know is funded through government funding agencies that that's ultimately funded by uh, by taxpayers. So I I think we we have to do a better job of, of communicating with the public and understanding that there is a thirst for knowledge, um, and we we really want to kind of help nip some of the. Um, misinformation bugs uh, in the bud while we can. And, and the mm -hmm. best way for us to do that uh, is by advocating for, for good science uh, wherever and, and however we can. Absolutely, that's such a great message to end today on advocating for good science. So thank you everyone um, for joining and thank you to the team at CHI for getting us all organized and doing a, a yes. test run for us. Um, we will be in touch about rounds. I'm not sure if we're going to be having virtual rounds um, for April or May, um, but we know how to contact you all and we'll publicly post about um, what's coming up. So, you know, if you were in person, we'd all clap very loudly for you now. <laughs> um, and, you know, you'd probably, well, I guess no more handshakes, maybe like an elbow. Yeah, bump yeah, no, no, we'll all put our, our hand <laughs> over our heart. And that, I, know, that I know you're very, very busy. So thank you so much for taking the time um, to talk to us today. And this will be available online. So so as I mentioned, this will be recorded uh, and the, we'll get that posted to the CHI YouTube channel. Uh, so feel free to come back to it and to share it. Uh, and thanks again, everyone. Uh, and we'll be in touch soon. Great. Thanks, everybody.